Hi friends, I hope you are doing well. I am Dr. Ganguly. Welcome to my channel. So today I will be discussing how to write a systematic review. And very often when people embark on any program to do research, maybe you are somebody doing a master's degree, PhD, or even somebody who is a bachelor student who has come for internship during the summer to some research university or research institute, your advisor or supervisor is likely to ask you to do a literature survey, write a systematic review. So I'm going to discuss eight different steps which are going to help you to write this systematic review out. And at the end of this, certainly you will know how to do this process. Now, even before we begin, the important question many students ask is, especially the current Gen Z students, is that why should I ever do a literature survey or a systematic review given that I can get this done by AI or something like that. Now, one of the reasons I think you should do it is that this is the way people actually learn about a particular research area. So it's not so much about writing the review itself, but about the person you become through the process of writing the review. So it's always important to remember this particular component in the education system that the reason your supervisor is asking you to write this systematic literature review is that they want you to read all these papers, they want you to understand all these papers, they want you to think about these papers critically and then write this review. So essentially this is training in critical thinking. In the bachelor's degree program, most people essentially indulge in rote learning, learning a lot of materials from books and then regurgitating this into the examinations. But what happens is that at the master's and PhD degree level, you have to figure out things on your own. You have to learn about critical thinking and so on. And this is being taught to you by the literature review process. So I would of course encourage you that you should not take advantage of too many AI tools here. You should try to do this on your own. If you are using AI like ChatGPT and so on, use them only to guide your work, but do not outsource your entire problem out to AI. Because in that case, what will happen is that after some time, AI will itself outsource things to itself rather than you. So that's something to keep in mind. Now let's start with number one question here, which is that you need to formulate the problem or formulate a question. So one of the things about a research question is that it should be clear, well-defined and relevant. So this question can often come to you from your supervisor itself. So generally the supervisor will give you a particular broad question and this is the question going to formulate your entire problem. So for example, there could be a question like how does class size impact student performance in calculus in high school? So this is a question which you can see is clear, well-defined, very relevant for modern day schooling and education. And so you can think of doing research on a problem like this. Now, there are many problems out there which are important problems for mankind and you can try to look at them in any situation. So even if you are a supervisor, you can think of such a problem to give to various students. Now we come to number two part and this is that once you have formulated a research question, you should develop a protocol about how to solve this problem. Now this word protocol essentially means a formal process or systemic way of doing something. So essentially what happens with this protocol is that even before you begin your literature search, you must have a clear plan. So let's look at some of the elements which are critical to the protocol. For example, you need to figure out which studies to include or exclude because as you realize there is going to be a plethora of literature out there on any broad topic and you don't want to keep all the papers involved. So you need to exclude some of the papers here. So this is certainly important to decide at this point as to what are the topics you are going to exclude here. Then you need to clarify what are the research objectives of your study. You need to create a search strategy and you need to create an analysis plan. So this protocol could be one or two or three pages long, but it could be something which essentially lays out a particular plan of what you are going to do next. And this is very important because it's going to certainly simplify your work. Now, point number three is that you have to search the publications. Now, in the old days, we had to do this in the libraries and so on. But nowadays, you have access to various databases such as the Web of Science, you have Scopus, you have Google Scholar. 
you can even search in google bing and so on now of course there are some pieces of research where you actually have to go to a library you may have to search in archives for example if you are looking at various documents involving history involving politics and so on and so in those cases the library visits are still indispensable so once you have searched these published papers you need to make an inventory of all these papers and then you go to step number four which is you have to select the studies now you may have selected let us say 50 papers in this particular area now you have to make a selection and reduce this list so here you have to use whatever plan you have developed in your protocol to choose only selected studies so you may take the 50 studies and wind it down to let's say 25 studies here which you are going to focus on more in the remaining part of your systematic review now point number five is extraction of data now here what you often need to do is that if you are following a quantitative type of work maybe you look at all these papers and you figure out what are the conclusions the data which has been generated in the study and so on you can keep this data somewhere maybe you can put it in an excel spreadsheet or if you are a person who is more old-fashioned you may write it out in yellow pads or in a notebook and that is something which is going to stay with you as to what information you have garnered from all these particular papers so again there are two types of works i would say there are works which are quantitative and then there are works with qualitative and so you need to get the data and express it in this form now the sixth point is that you have to sit down and evaluate the studies now this is where most of the time actually goes in and you have to look at all the studies you have to rank them or you have to think about them in terms of the quality of the work in terms of the different biases which the people have in doing the work the critical thinking process has to be involved here the various assumptions which have been made have to be looked at and so on so this is where your critical thinking hat becomes very important you have to put on the so-called black hat thinking and you have to critique each work as if you are a paper referee so you have to look at these papers and you have to see what are the assumptions they have made what could be the weaknesses in these papers and so on so now your objective here is to actually try to find various weaknesses in these papers that's something which is going to bring out a better systematic review if you find the different weaknesses and so on now this is where most of the critical thinking in the academic circle comes from the art of looking at any study critically now the point number seven is to synthesize the result and this is where you have to look at all the data you have gathered all the different pieces of paragraphs which you have written out about the different papers and so on and then you have to synthesize all this particular information now again this can sometime involve a process of going to the papers writing things about it going to the paper again writing more things and so on and at the end of this particular endeavor you are somebody who has digested all this material so for example if you had selected 25 papers now you know all the information which is there in the different papers here now finally you come to point number eight which is you need to write the review now typically a review has the same format as a typical paper so you are going to have a title abstract introduction methods results discussions conclusions and references and so what you now need to do is you need to look at the different quantitative data which you have collected you need to look at the descriptive surveys you have collected and the various critical points you have got about the paper and now you have to collate all these things together and write a document out of it now this exercise is extremely important because not only it teaches you the art of critical thinking but it also teaches you how to write so very often people when they do their master's degree project or they are even doing a bachelor's degree or certainly a phd the first problem given to them by their advisor is to essentially write out a systematic review and in this process the student actually learns very skills many skills like the critical thinking skill the writing skill and so on and at the end of this process you are also somebody who is going to become aware of the different research gaps and weaknesses which are out there in the literature so at the end of this you may even be asked to make a presentation to the supervisor or to the department lab or any committee and this is going to certainly help you to narrow down a particular problem which you can address in detail later so one of the ways to find a research gap in the literature 
is to do this systematic literature review and that is why this is such an important part of the research process. Now very frequently this review is not going to be something which is going to be published. Most often this is going to make its way as the first chapter of your thesis. So whether you are writing a master's thesis, particularly a MPhil thesis or an MRes thesis, this is going to be a very important part of this. And certainly if you are going to do a PhD, this is going to be a very important part of this. Now the main difference is going to be of course the difference in the scale of the problem. So when you typically do a PhD, you take on a problem which is more intense and you therefore cover a larger literature and the gap you find is bigger. In case you do a master's degree, that gap is particularly smaller, you do a smaller problem and so on. Now again, it is up to a good advisor to figure out what is a problem which is suitable for a master's degree candidate and what is a problem which is suitable for a PhD degree candidate. Now I am going to give you several links at the end screen which you are going to use to further delve into this topic about research and how to progress beyond the systematic review into actually doing the research.